everybody. How are you? We all good? Yes. 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 Yeah. Full crowd here tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight to the NWS Sydney 54th meetup. So we've got a good crowd here this evening. Thank you all for coming. So thank you to our sponsors tonight. We have Color 7, but also who are going around in the white shirts. But we have Salesforce here. There are a few. You guys want to raise your hands. There's a couple at the back down there. So if you want to talk to the Salesforce guys, they're hanging around there. So just a quick overview of this evening. Tonight we're going to have Mike from Salesforce giving us a quick chat through. Then we're going to talk do some networking with some beers and pizza. And then we're going to have Mike again doing some drone flying demonstration. Did you bring the drone with you? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Good stuff. So. Otherwise, it'd be difficult. Then we do a Q&A, which uh, Salesforce have laid on, and we're going to do, or sorry, the prize draw at the end. Has everybody here signed in on the way in this evening to get their name in the draw? Yes? Yes? Good stuff. So you get your name in the draw, and we'll do a prize draw at the end of it for everyone. Which is a really nice bottle of whiskey, so. Anybody? Yeah. Nobody wants it, so that's fine. I'm sure we'll uh, find some place for it. So software developers are the artists of the coding world, and Heroku allows them to code quickly. Who here has used Heroku? We got a couple? Yeah? Good stuff, we have a few. What do you think of it? Good? Yeah, yeah? thumbs up? Awesome, great. So you know it runs on AWS, which is good, so we can have it on an AWS wheel. <laughs> so good stuff, with that, I'll just hand over to Mike, and uh, did you take it over from there? So I'm Mike. Hello. So I'm Mike Myers, I'm the solution engineer that works for Tim Tim. So I come with something called Salesforce. Has anyone heard of Salesforce? Okay. Well, apart from the Salesforce people. Yeah. <laughs> Any Salesforce people, come and put your hands up. Please. Okay, so we'll talk a bit about Salesforce App Cloud. So most people when they hear about Salesforce or <coughs> CRM, and they think, what is the CRM company doing at Amazon Web Services for the Well, two things. So some of you may have seen an agreement that we made with Amazon a few months ago about running our infrastructure. So like all of you, so like all of you. Can you hear down the back? Hello, hello. It's up the top. So like all of you, who use Amazon for an infrastructure service, Salesforce will be doing it part of our rollout. What we also use it for is a product called Heroku. Hands up, who's heard of Heroku? Hands up, who've used Heroku? Hands up, who likes Heroku? Everyone's hands should still be done. <laughs> we'll talk about that. So how many people have been to a Salesforce presentation before? Phew, that's not bad, it's not bad. So each of you would be able to recite these words off by heart, shouldn't you? <laughs> so we are a publicly traded company, and we do take that, um, as it said, we take it with trust. And trust is our number one value that we have in our organization. So some of you may have seen that we were the number one company to work for in Australia, publicly announced a couple of days ago, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> And as part of that comes with trust. And it's not only trust with you as our customers, but it's you, us as employees. So we have this trust within our family, and we call it the Salesforce of Hana. So we like to think of our customers, our partners, all part of that family. And it comes with that level of trust. And so with trust, we also like organizations to buy software that they know that they can trust and they can use in the future. So the Salesforce forward-looking statement says that if we do talk about anything in our roadmap that does come up, Please always make your buying decisions about, future, uh, about things that are in the current release, not forward looking statement release. So, we are a trusted company, a bit about Salesforce, we are a trusted company. Um, we are on the Fortune 500, most admired companies, and we are six years in a row one of the most innovative companies out there about what we do on our platform, which is a massive thing. But there's a lot of stuff things that we're doing in the background on our platform that goes beyond basic CRM. It's about helping organizations engage with their customers in a different way. Another part of why Salesforce is also the number one company to work for 
is this model that we have here, the philanthropic model. It's the fact that we're not only here for profit, we're here to give back. As an organization, we are mandated to give back not only 1% of our time, but 1% of our software and 1% of our equity to non-profit organizations. And there's a number of non-profit organizations out there that use our software to better the world, to better our experience. We also give back in terms of pro bono, helping charities out, use our software for their games, to do some of their projects. And one of the pieces, one of the companies that we've been doing, critical, and one of the companies we've been doing that with is a company called Otar. And they've been working with us to build an application on our platform to help, um, help detect autism with families. <coughs> when people have got young kids, they want to try and detect autism in the kids early on in that stages. And the quickest way to do that is by putting something in the hands of their parents in the form of a mobile app where they can look at the videos and look at their children and try and determine does their kid suffer from autism. They go through a series of questions, and those questions are fed from Heroku into Salesforce to work out through an algorithm, are is their children likely to have autism? And if so, they can be identified and they can be put on a plan to help them out. This is, I'm just going to play this for a few minutes, given time, just to show you guys what we're doing with this company. If we detect autism early, we can then begin to assist that young person to learn and to learn from other people. And that has knock-on effects on the quality of that person's life later on. It's very difficult to come to terms that there might be something different about your child. When you're a parent and you are taking your concerns to a healthcare professional and they're saying you're overly anxious or to wait and see, they start to question their own parenting abilities. So we at OTARC are committed to developing an early detection tool that everybody around the world can use. And Salesforce is giving us that opportunity. Early intervention is so important because it really can change children's lives. So looking for behaviours such as smiling, such as pointing to a bird or a plane, and if they're missing, then this child might actually be developing autism. Over the last 10 years, we have conducted two large-scale developmental surveillance studies with an accuracy of 81%. This is the most accurate tool for early detection in the world. The way we did this work was we trained hundreds of nurses to monitor young children when they came in for their routine checkups. Once we implemented Salesforce and wrapped it around our early detection program, we were having those hundreds of nurses putting in the tens of thousands of records immediately and us being able to help intake that child really quickly and that family really quickly. The natural progression for that was putting that into a mobile device and giving that power to parents. So a parent will watch a series of videos looking at various social communication behaviours. They'll then answer a question such as, does your child point to a teddy? So suddenly parents now have a powerful tool they can use on their phone, on their iPad, on their computer, which can guide them toward assessing their little child. We needed a platform that meant if we're actually going in the hundreds of thousands or the millions of users really quickly, we needed something that was going to give us that ability. The way we did that was using Heroku. We used Salesforce to send emails to them to say, hey, you've got an at-risk status. What does it mean to have an at-risk status? What does autism actually mean? Unpacking those really big, maybe even scary words to properly communicate with the family, hey, you're on this new journey now and it's going to be okay. So I'm just going to pause it there. Um, I'm going to show you now, some of the things you heard on that video is the level of skill which you think you're going to put a mobile phone into every parent's hand. So, if there's any parents in the room, I urge you to download this app. It's free from the App Store or the Google Play Store, and it allows you to look at your children and detect whether they do have autism. It's a hard question to look at, but it's something that's really vital in their big up. Now, there's other things that this video talked about. There's a lot of stakeholders in that video which go beyond the technical nature that we all sit in. So we can all code what needs me out.
Right. There's a lot of stakeholders in that organization that go beyond having a technical nature. These are nurses, these are carers, these are people that need to engage in the information without having to be technical genius. How do you take that information all of these guys have built in that mobile phone app on Heroku and put it in a world where they can digest that information quickly in order to understand who is at risk, understand the information, look at it from, from a holistic point of view and understand and be able to report that information quickly. That's where Salesforce comes in using Heroku and the CRM component and AppCloud together where information can be taken from the Heroku side of the world and be pumped into all of the stakeholders and put that information into people's hands who can act. And we'll talk a bit about that as we go through. So I just want to get a show of hands. How many developers do we have in the room? How many DevOps people do we have in the room? How many mix between the both? How many DevOps people? That's a good one. So how many people can put their hands up and say, this is you? How many people's wives and girlfriends say to them at 10 o'clock at night, are you coming to bed? Because you, I mean, no, 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 a couple of minutes, trying to get this bug out, this piece of code, no. Come on, put your hands up. I'm definitely one of them. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you say to your wives? What do you say to your wives? I'll be five more minutes, I'll be five yeah. more minutes. Yeah. And then when she wakes up in the morning, this is you. <laughs> Because something oh, didn't go yet. right. Something didn't go right in the code, the infrastructure, deployed the code to somewhere, and something just yeah. wasn't right. Heroku tries to solve that. It tries to fix that problem for developers. So it wants to remove that level of pain and that level of um, that level of issues that you have and just focus on the code that you're writing. Become the artist. So the front screen that you saw at the front, when we talked about the art of Heroku. That's all of us. That's us as developers. We all develop beautiful code, and we all do. So anyone who tells you otherwise, they're lying to you. Everyone develops beautiful code, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's all in the eyes of the person who looks at the code. But there's a world where you want to actually move on from that. And who's heard of Jez Humble? One person? Two, three? Yep. Jez Humble, who wrote a book on continuous delivery, and he said, really truthfully, software is only worth something when you put it into the hands of the user. So if you could accelerate that time scales and you could accelerate those timelines and put them into the hands of users quicker, it would be worth a lot more. And it doesn't have to be just revenue. It could be bonus points. It could be success. It could be IT finally delivered something back to the business. So a customer and a user doesn't have to be an external person. It doesn't have to be someone downloading something from the app store. It can be an internal stakeholder who wants access to the app quickly to understand what's going on. And Salesforce and Heroku helps with that. So Heroku is a platform that takes your code and runs it to whatever scale you want. You can develop in whatever language you want. It supports multi-languages. There's a number of supported ones and there's a number of unsupported ones which provide build packs for you to manage your code. But you can develop in whatever IDE you want. I like Atom because I downloaded the video. Who's, who's seen the video for Atom? No one's seen the Atom video? You get no, no, ID. No. Go to YouTube later, you have to watch this video about Atom. It made me download it, it made me use it. It made me move from Sublime to Atom in terms of it because of the video. It was a fantastic video. And if you think any marketing people in the back, marketing sales, by the way, so that's worth it. So Heroku is a platform. It was designed for developers by developers. It was designed to make developers' lives easier. It went to a world where you're taking your code and running it to wherever you want to go to. We saw before with OTOP, we saw before with OTOP a million users, or two billion, or as it goes around the world, it could be anywhere you want to. How do you deal with that level of request for what you need to? So how do you take your code and deploy it around whatever you need to do from some levels of scale that you need to take it to in order to take that code and be able to use it for people's hands. So I hope it does that. It deals with 8 billion requests a day over the 5 million apps that have been created on our platform. It's developed to have what give the developer experience, developer that first. Everything about this platform is developed with the developer in mind. And there's three parts I want to talk about today. So the dynos, the data, and the elements will break down. We'll see why this is important. So 
A dyno is a computational package. And as you commit your code into GitHub and deploy it to Heroku, it turns that code into a dyno. So it packages it up with your build pack, so it understands the language that you've developed in, whatever language it is, gives you environment variables to package with it so you can take it and move it between production, dev, staging environments and just tell it where you want to run it to. But it can also give you things like add-ons as well. There's an ecosystem of add-ons and I'll talk about in a bit. But that level of power you need is at scale. So you want to start off really small, one dyno. Hobby dyno, you start off and play around with it. And you just drag that box however much you want to, and it scales those dynos across that computational need that you have. And each dyno can be scaled to have more RAM, more CPU, more usage, and you don't have to worry about building up, setting up the infrastructure. As a developer, you're just committing your code and dragging that little slider, scale up and scale down. There's a package on the um, on the ad store on the on the add-ons for the elements that helps you do things like hiring and firing dynos when you don't need it, so you can automate it. In terms of data, there's a set of data and storage that we have. So Postgres is one, Redis, MySQL. Uh, MongoDB. We've also just released announcements for Kafka and Cassandra as well that we, we can use. In terms of elements as well, so as developers, there's things that we want. So, what kind of elements do you think you need in your package? What kind of elements would you use? So, what, as developers, what do you use to test your code? What do you use to monitor your code? What kind of packages are out there? This guy's wearing one right now. Simo logic. Perfect app for developers. Developers love it. There's an app package on Heroku for Sumo logic. There's one for New Relic. There's one for Paper Patrol, monitoring your logs, looking for your logs when you're finding those bugs, you know, finding those issues with your brush strokes where you wrote that code badly. But there's a whole set of categories which, as developers, you don't have to worry about how do you install it, how do you patch it, how do you integrate it. There are two clicks. One, you click on the Add Elements box on the resources. Two, you search for the one and you click on Add. That's it. Heroku takes care of the rest. It takes care of the add-on and packages it with it. It gives you a set of properties for depending on the add-on that you want to integrate with, you set properties of what you want. But as you scale up and you scale down, those add-ons go with it. So as your app increases, you don't have to worry about all of your add-ons that you have to increase in terms of scale as well. So as we commit our code, and we never deploy to production obviously, but as we commit our code into GitHub repositories, this is the process that Heroku goes to take your code and turn it into an app. And I'll run through this in the next section to show you how it works. So it detects those four words you have detected, git push Heroku master. So you're taking your code and pushing it into Heroku, and Heroku does the best. You don't even have to tell it what language you wrote it in, you don't even have to tell it um, what you want to do with it. It detects the language when it's pushed on it. If it's a supported build pack, it will find that build pack and merge it together in a dyno. If it's not a supported build pack, there's a hundreds and hundreds of build packs out there that other people have wrote for .NET and other languages as well, which you can specify in your command to tell it what build pack Heroku should take. Now, that's also good as well. You can even specify the, not, the version number of the build pack you want. So if you want it to run on an early version of Ruby, earlier version of Node, that's all can be taken care of for you as well as a part of your command line interface. And the slug compiler takes that dyno and compiles it into a slug. Wraps it with your environment variables, for whatever environment variables you have, things like web ports, HTTP ports, etc., etc. And then it gets it ready to be released. And once it's pushed out, it's pushed out as a dyno. Heroku then works out is how much does that dyno need to scale. So it takes that dyno and puts it onto the dyno grid and scales it up and down for what you need to or what you specify. It's really, really simple. And that's why it's developed for developers. Now, how many people have stakeholders in their business? And what, what kind of things do they say to you? Awesome. 
Fantastic salt. <laughs> <laughs> you said the magic word. Increased delivery time. So, stakeholder, how do you take what you've done and get it into the hands of your stakeholders really, really quickly? More importantly, how do you take what you've done and don't cause extra headaches for them? So you built this app, fantastic. It's running here, it's collecting data in whatever data deposit you want. How do they get that data and push it into their workflows, into the business process? Heroku, being Salesforce, is tied into the Salesforce master data. So wherever your customer data sits inside of Salesforce, all of that data is interchangeable with it. It has an abstract data model. Whatever data model you've got inside of Salesforce can easily be pushed into a Postgres database using something called Heroku Connect. We'll talk about it in a minute. But more importantly, it's increased delivery time. Now you don't have to worry about infrastructure, or you don't have to worry about patching, or you don't have to worry about setting all of this up. You can commit as many times as you want a day. You can commit multiple times a day. Financial Times in England uses Heroku, and they commit up to 200 times a day. How many developers have committed 200 times a day? It's an unheard of, isn't it? Being able to commit your code, go through the build stage, the test stage, the quantity review stage, and push it into a place where someone can access it is incredible. And to put, take, your word, take your point about putting it into the hands of the stakeholders, when you commit your app through GitHub, it creates something called a review app. So if you haven't branched it back into your master, you haven't merged it into your master, you've taken a branch and you've made your changes on it. As you commit it into GitHub, it creates a pull request which Heroku can detect and it creates a review app. And a review app is completely separated from your production, your staging, your development environment. It's a spin up and spin down throwaway app that people can go to and look at, see what you've done. So you can send a link to someone and say, is this what you were expecting? They go, oh, yeah, that's fantastic, but no, you change this, change that, change that. It means it's more agile, it's quicker, quicker to iterate, quicker to commit, quicker to success. And so on. So if you can do that 200 times a day, user experience is also mm -hmm. I've, I've got a, I'm trying to book a holiday or something, you know, so the new application. No, because they're, they're committing, they're not committing to production so many times a day. They're committing into doing and staging and they're promoting it into production during their proper release cycle. So, but that's in essence what Financial Times does. So if you log into Financial Times in the morning, it'd be a lot different to what you see in the afternoon and the evening because they do go through that cycle. They do move from a review app where they can check with the stakeholders, is that what you're expecting, go through the proper testing cycles, and easily release those functions back into production quicker. So they're testing. If you log into Financial Times tomorrow morning, it'll be different to what you see tomorrow night because of what they're doing. They can release it quicker because of this as well. Okay. Um, it, yeah, we support different environments if you can give up and get down because of the diners and put it where that. Is it zero downtime? Yeah, zero downtime. A few seconds. Because of the dino. So, what you're doing is you're creating these new dinos. Are you promoting the dino? Yeah. All right. you're, you're, you're promoting the slug across. The into, so, the slug is your package of the code. And then that takes it onto the grid in whatever area and scales it up to what you need to go to. So, I'll show you. I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll commit a, a sample app. We'll move it through the cycle and I'll show you how it scales up and scales down for what you want in seconds. So you can take it and scale it up to whatever you need to be. But it's within seconds, so it's not that huge lead time that you're expecting. It's not like sub second, but it's a couple of seconds to move it up to what you want. <laughs> how, many, how many people deal with this? How many people get phone calls at 4 or 4 in the morning? Saying this is not working, this is not happening. Heroku also helps with this. So Heroku detects issues in your dyno. So if a dyno crashes, it will restart it a few times. And if it can't, then it will email. It will email telling you there's something seriously wrong. It will deal with it. But if it's like one time it crashes and it can restart it, get up and going, you don't have to get paged at 4 o'clock in the morning. We wear the page up. It also deals with the fact that every 24 hours we make sure that your dyno is optimal. So we restart your dynos every 24 hours. No users are impacted by that because of the level of the dynos that we deal with. The other thing as well is we version control every single commit you do. So every single slug you committed into a dyno package can be rolled back at the click of a button. So you can click a button 
and you can roll back to version 39, 38, 37, 36, all the way through to whatever you want to. And it's not by pushing your code back in, it's just clicking a button saying, I want to roll back to that part. And it doesn't do anything different. All it does is promote the traffic to that dyno. That dyno or that slug is already there. It's just promoting that traffic to that version and then scaling up to what it should be for the level of scale you need to. So it's not going for that big wait time that you've got a few minutes to wait for, you know, an hour to wait for, for that version to go back. It's actually, that version is actually still sitting there and it's just promoting the traffic to it and then scaling it for what you need to go to. But it still keeps the other version intact. So this comes back into the other part about stakeholders. So we all write wonderful apps that engage customers in a different way or engage people in a different way. There's a lot of things that your apps are doing about collecting information that the business would love to get hold of. They would love to analyze it. They would love to push it into their workflows. In fact, how many organizations are trying to achieve that utopia view, a single customer view? A single customer view. How many people have put MDMs in, et cetera, et cetera? How many people have got silos out there that are using ETL tools to move, ETL tools to move data around? Heroku helps by that. It has one abstract view of the data. We use something called Heroku Connect, which takes your data model either in Postgres or in Salesforce and maps it between the two. And it takes care of the syncing of the information for you. So whatever model you build in Postgres, as the data gets updated through your mobile apps or the websites or whatever you're doing, it's automatically pushed at the granular level of the attribute back into Salesforce. And then anything that's built in there, such as workflows, reports, except marketing campaigns, etc., all get kicked off. The customer only sees, well, your customer, the internal customer, only sees one view of Mike. When I log into the mobile app or the website, I still see that same view. And when I call up the call center, they still see that same view. And that can go to whatever level you want, case, interaction, etc. So if you guys are recording what interactions I'm doing in my mobile app, or I clicked on this offer, I clicked on this voucher, but I didn't redeem it, all of that could be used for analytical purposes inside of the process the business stakeholders can use. So how many times did a user or a customer go to the website, clicked on that um, product, but didn't buy it? Well, if you record that interaction, it could be analyzed in Salesforce in real time or sub-second time. And that's the art of Heroku in 25 minutes, 25 minutes. That was very quick. So I think the plan is to take a short break, take a short break. When we come back, I'll run through a quick demo. I'll show you what we've built with a drone as well. And then if you ask some questions, we'll go from there. Thank you. Okay, so we have some uh, pizzas lined up here, some beers, have a quick mm -hmm. nabber. And then we come back with some questions, yeah? Everybody got some questions? Thank you, guys.